CHOU 11 NEWS STARTS NOW. DON'T COME TO TEXAS uh, AND EMBARRASS US HERE IN OUR HOME TURF, RIGHT, GUYS? YOU GOT IT. TALK TUCK FROM HOUSTON'S POLICE CHIEF AFTER ANNOUNCING HOW TOM BRADY'S MISSING JERSEY WAS FINALLY FOUND AND WHAT WE KNOW ABOUT THE FORMER JOURNALIST ACCUSED OF SWIPING IT. AND NO TEXTING OR TALKING WHILE HOLDING ONTO YOUR PHONE AND YOUR STEERING WHEEL. HOW THE CITY OF SUGARLAND IS CRACKING DOWN ON DRIVERS AND THEIR CELL PHONES. But we begin with Jersey Gate. Houston's police chief saying that his investigators helped solve the mystery of Tom Brady's stolen Super Bowl jersey. So glad we got this worked yeah. out. We're learning the person accused of snatching it could be a former journalist from Mexico. Brandy Smith live in the newsroom to explain how police tracked the jersey down. Brandy? Yeah, well, that jersey was taken from NRG Stadium after Super Bowl 51. Mexican and U.S. media report a former newspaper executive allegedly used his press credential to get access to the Patriots locker room and Tom Brady's jersey. You don't come to Texas uh, and you don't steal when the eyes of the world are upon uh, our state. That national and international attention on Tom Brady's missing Super Bowl jersey is why Chief Art Acevedo says his department's major offenders division was determined to recover it. But if it can be found, it will be found. Uh, by the Houston Police Department. He says an HPD informant coughed up who grabbed number 12's jersey. Then his team worked with the FBI and Mexican investigators to find that person, along with the very valuable memorabilia. Acevedo said another jersey, the one Brady wore in Super Bowl 49, was also recovered. They're now being authenticated by the FBI and NFL. If they are the real deal, the person who had them could face federal charges. We're highly confident that these are, in fact, the jerseys based on our investigative uh, efforts. Those efforts, not a top priority for the department, according to the chief, but he thinks locker room security will be one for the NFL. They really need to check their protocols uh, and their efforts because uh, this is at least two jerseys that we're aware of, and obviously it required uh, a response from the Houston Police Department and other partners to recover them. Now, that federal charge Acevedo mentioned was interstate transportation of stolen property. The U.S. Attorney's Office tells me it carries a penalty of up to 10 years in prison, but because the case is still under investigation, no charges have been filed yet. Live in the newsroom, Brandy Smith, KHOU 11 News. Oh, very interesting, Brandy. Thank you. And we've been hearing all day, as Brandy mentioned, the jerseys were traced back to a Mexican journalist who was credentialed for the game. Yeah, and minutes ago, the newspaper confirmed that he did work for them. Jason Bristol is here with some video of that journalist taken right after the Super Bowl. Jason? Uh, indeed, we have video of this guy. He was right in front of our camera as our crew was one of the first into the Patriots locker room. Now, we are blurring his face and not identifying him at this time because he still hasn't been charged with a crime but he is a journalist as you mentioned and that paper he worked for in Mexico says it had no idea he was involved until today now this is video we've shown before on air and online from Daniel Gotera and photojournalist Mike Orta and with all this new information coming in there's a couple of things from this video which now really stands out first of all look how close this guy is to Tom Brady I mean it's incredible and second we know noticed he's leaving as the rest of the media, including us, starts to come in the locker room. Now, if he was there doing his job, he'd be waiting by the locker of the guy or guys he was hoping to interview. And here's another reason why this guy was never on our radar, even though we looked at this video dozens and dozens of times, frame by frame. We cannot see his credential right here. We had no way of knowing if he was a member of the media, a team doctor, or someone with the NFL. But it's possible this piece of video was an important piece of the puzzle in trying to crack this case. But again, he has not been charged with a crime in this incredible case of Tom Brady's missing jersey. And just moments ago, Tom Brady thanking law enforcement for returning his memorabilia. <laughs> Guys? <laughs> Reported worth half a million dollars. I guess he would be happy. Yeah. A lot of fuss and muss over that jersey. Thank you, Jason. Mm -hmm. Starting today, it is a crime to hold your phone and communicate while driving in Sugar Land. This means no texting, no talking, no navigating with your phone if you're not using a hands-free device. Matt Daugherty is live in Sugar Land with details of a hefty fine facing distracted drivers. Matt. Yeah, well, you know, Sugarland can be a busy place, especially during this time of the afternoon. But luckily, a three-month grace period will get drivers busted for distracted driving off the hook with a warning from police. 
but after mid-June, if you're caught doing this, you could be paying a big fine. Now here's what you need to know about the new ordinance. Each offense carries a possible $500 fine. Violations are a Class C misdemeanor. If you're stopped by police, you don't have to turn over your phone. They would need a warrant to search or seize it. That 90-day grace period ends on June the 18th, and after that, Sugarland police say they'll start enforcing the ordinance. Uh, this is no different than a speeding motorist or somebody running a stop sign. It's not something that we're going to actively be out on the streets looking for. However, when we do encounter it, then we'll address it at that time. Now, there is one time when you are allowed to use your cell phone when you're driving and not get into any trouble, and that is during the course of an emergency. So you want to remember that. Also, coming up tonight at 5 o'clock, we'll tell you why not all of the fines will be $500. You could actually be paying a lot less. We've got that at 5 o'clock. But for now, we are live in Sugarland this hour. Matt Doherty, KHU 11 News. Matt, thank you. A lot of people will be uh, having their eyes and their hands down. <laughs> Following the rules, because right. that, that fine will catch your attention. Sure will. It's the first day of spring, but doesn't quite feel like spring, does it? Yeah, it's pretty warm outside, David Paul. Almost feels like a summer day out here, guys. We're on the porch, Channel 11 Studios, uh, just a mile to the west of downtown. It's gorgeous out here. I mean, it is just spectacular. You, you, you plant it, you put water on it, and it will grow in weather like this today. Temperatures are in the 80s outside right now. we got a breeze. Make sure you take a walk this evening, get outside. Uh, it's not always like this, though, on the first day of spring. We look back at the history books, 90 is the record high uh, for this first day of spring in Houston, set back in 1907. It's been as cold as a morning low of 24. A year ago, it was 61 degrees for a high temp on this day. So last year was much cooler, 25 degrees cooler than it is today. Coming up, we'll look at the allergy picture, which is still going bonkers. I'll show you which pollens are highest, and I'll look ahead to the next chance for rain. Guys, from the Channel 11 porch, back to you. All right, you have the best seat in the house. Thank you, David Paul. We are learning some new disturbing information from prosecutors about a 19-year-old woman accused of forcing a girl into sex slavery. Denise Coronado is charged with compelling prostitution of a minor. A 14-year-old girl tells police she was walking down the street when she was stuffed into a van and kept in some woods. Then five days later, she was taken to a Houston motel, where Coronado allegedly photographed her for online prostitution ads. Investigators say Coronado threatened the girl, burned her with a cigarette, and forced her to have sex with 26 men, all in just one week's time. The girl was able to escape this month. New details on what police believe is a murder-suicide involving a husband and his high-profile wife. This was in Fort Bend County. Yeah, we are learning the wife was a transplant surgeon at Houston Methodist Hospital. Fort Bend County deputies found the bodies of Dr. Sherilyn Burroughs and her husband Daniel Burroughs at their home on River Cliff Court in Richmond yesterday. Deputies believe the husband shot his wife, then took his own life. The couple has a four-year-old daughter who was with her grandparents at the time. An autopsy is being performed on the bodies. Investigators have not said what may have led up to the shootings. Police want you to take a look at a sketch of a, a new sketch of a man involved in the murder of a Houston father during an attempted carjacking. Back on March 11, police say two men pulled Pedro Aguilar out of his car and then shot him in front of his wife and daughter. This happened outside the family's home on Richcrest. Police say the men got upset when they realized they couldn't drive Aguilar's car because it was standard shift. This is surveillance video taken just before the crime. Detectives think the two men may have gotten out of a white car moments before the robbery. Crime Stoffers is offering a $5,000 reward for information. Traffic flowing again normally on the Katy Freeway after a two-car fiery wreck turned deadly this morning. Air 11 overhead shows you one car badly burned, another flipped over on its side. That's a pickup there. This all happened on the westbound side near Pin Oak and the Katy Mills Mall. The lanes opened back up about 1.30 this afternoon. Congress is holding its first public hearings in whether Russia interfered with the 2016 presidential elections. Lawmakers want to know how, how far did Russia go, apparently trying to help President Trump win. Greg Hurst here now with a closer look. Greg. And these hearings focused on Russia, also government leaks and wiretaps, but the FBI director refused to acknowledge active investigations or people who might be specific targets, with one notable exception. I have been authorized by the Department of Justice to confirm that the FBI, as part of our counterintelligence mission, is investigating the Russian government's efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential election. That includes 
investigating the nature of any links between individuals associated with the Trump campaign and the Russian government, and whether there was any coordination between the campaign and Russia's efforts. The director said that it was clear Russian President Vladimir Putin chose size during the election and clearly favored Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton and said Russia actively worked to undermine the Clinton campaign. The president responded with a series of these tweets claiming the Russian connection was made up by the Democrats saying the real story was the leaking of classified information. Now, the director said it is important to investigate and prosecute those responsible for any leaks, although he wouldn't confirm an active leak investigation. Now, the FBI director also addressed the president's claim that he had been wiretapped by former President Obama. Comey said his agency has no information supporting that allegation and furthermore said the president wouldn't have the authority to even order it. It was a busy day on Capitol Hill. It certainly Lynn. was. Greg, thank you. You bet. A former teacher is accused of kidnapping a teenage student. Just to head the manhunt across multiple states and the disturbing allegations against that teacher. Caught on camera, a dangerous case of road rage leads to a horrific crash. How other drivers then came to the rescue. Oh my gosh, look at that. And later, state lawmakers taking up Houston's new pension plan. 1,500 city jobs could be at risk if the plan fails.